Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, thank you everyone for being here, for being here, and uh, let's, uh, let's get started. Apologies for the slight delay. The, uh, the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang yesterday said something to the effect that um, as part of structural reforms, you need to reduce the number of approvals that uh, you need to get to get things done. And I was wondering whether in the international arena, we're going in the opposite direction, some sort of reverse structural reforms. Uh, and that's really the subject of uh, the debate today. Uh, the question is, will intensified geoeconomic competition derail economic growth and, uh, and impair the steady march of integration that we've seen for many years prior? Particularly when you look at it from the perspective of, um, of business, trade, supply chains, capital flows, investments? Or is it the other, is it completely a flash in the pan? Is it a blip? Is it just, uh, just noise that will not have any material impact on either globalization or economic growth? So that's the subject of our debate today. And before I come to my distinguished panel here, I would like to invite uh, the distinguished um, uh, audience, members of the audience around this uh, arena, uh, to please vote your position on this motion using your smartphones. Uh, that's the URL, wef.ch slash vote. I'm told it's very easy, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to hit agree or disagree, please. So what I'm hoping for is that this will give us a starting point for uh, the baseline, the starting point for the needle um, that we start the debate with, and we'll see whether it moves, how far it moves uh, at the end of the debate again. I should also say that during the entire course of the debate, if you'd like to participate, um, send in your comments, and this applies to people that may not be here in the room as well, uh, you can tweet your comments. The hashtag is hashtag equal growth, and uh, it'll appear in the iPad that I have here, and um, if I can, I'll try and bring some of those comments in as well. And of course, during q and I'd very much appreciate um, active aggressive participation uh, from all of you here. Okay, um, Donald, should we take a look at the results, please? Okay, 60% agree, 40% disagree, and I should say that the online poll that we had before the start of the session, uh, it was pretty much it's pretty, pretty much consistent with this. It's about two-thirds agree and a third disagree. So let's uh, dive straight into it. Uh, let me introduce uh, my panel, please. I'll start with Mr. Pascal Lamy. Pascal Lamy is Honorary President, North Europe, Jacques Delors Institute in, in France, former European Trade Commissioner and Director General of the World Trade Organization, WTO. To my right is Dr. Lee. Dr. Li Dakui is Professor of Finance at Tsinghua University and formerly member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the People's Bank of China. Annabel Gonzalez. Annabel is Senior Director for Trade and Competitiveness at the World Bank, previously Minister of Trade uh, in Costa Rica. And Kirill Dmitriev. Kirill is Chief Executive Officer of the Russia Direct Investment Fund formerly with Goldman Sachs and McKinsey. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for my panel, please. Okay, so my first question, Mr. Lamy, I'd like to start with you, sir. Uh, if you wouldn't mind giving us your position on the debate uh, and whether we should really be worried. 
Yeah, I've been, uh, like you, assigned on the side of, uh, the yes side, i.e. Uh, there is a strong risk that geopolitical and geoeconomic competition uh, derails the present course of globalization in terms of integration and growth. Now, I think the starting point is pretty clear. Uh, there is a growing discrepancy, uh, uh, sometimes on the verge of rupture, uh, between economic integration on the one side and uh, political integration on the other side. And this is a very risky zone, as uh, one big uh, philosopher in the 20th century, <coughs> who is called uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, showed when he analyzed uh, the reasons that led to the Second World War. Uh, his basic point was that the fundamental reason was what he called a disembedding of economy on the one side and society on the other side. Now, I think this is something that might happen. Why? Basically because these uh, two beds, these two clusters are run uh, differently. At the end of the day, uh, the big aggregating factor in integration, uh, in globalization, is uh, technology, uh, market capitalism, markets, which in many ways are rational. It's the domain of reason. Of course, entrepreneurs have to use passion, and the relationship they have with the consumer sometimes is about passion. But the system as a whole works with the law of reason. Now, politics, on the other side, uh, works with the laws of passion. Uh, politics is about mobilizing people on your side. Whatever argument you can find uh, to uh, put them on your side. And we know by experience that irrational pitches are, in politics, sometimes much more efficient than rational pitches. So that's, in my view, the root of the problem. Uh, this is why. Uh, we are entering a very dangerous zone. First, we still have old issues of the previous centuries, uh, which have to do with uh, territorial ambitions, disputes, wars, what's happening between Russia and the uh, US EU uh, on one side, uh, for instance, is a clear resurgence of 17th, 18th, 19th century classical conflicts. There is a bit of that uh, brewing in the China Sea, although uh, both Japan and China uh, have been, let's say, uh, behaving as responsible Westphalian animals so far. So far. So we have this set of issues. But on top of that, we now have a political mobilization under the form of populism, uh, which is based on identity preservation or promotion, and where lots of populist movements on this planet uh, are uh, mobilizing proximity against distance. And in an era of globalization, mobilizing proximity against distance can be politically extremely efficient. Uh, it's us and them, mm -hmm. which is the good old uh, story of how to divide politics. Uh, if you take the relationship this has with the economic side, it's no coincidence, in my view, that uh, populist movements, whether in Europe, in US, in India, you'll tell us about China, I'm not quite sure on how I would define populism in China, but I'm sure there's a bit of that down there. Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil. It's no coincidence that whether on the right or on the left, all these populist movements are protectionist. That's a fact. And this is where I see the uh, red zone. Uh, and I think we've already stepped into that. 
Now, is, it, is there a solution to that? Intellectually, there are two possible solutions. Number one is uh, slow globalization, which is what some are advocating. Uh, uh, number two is uh, adopt some sort of charter of how to responsibly run globalization in a responsible way, which has to do with morals, with ethics, which is a bit more than what exists in the international system. Now, the first avenue, in my view, doesn't make sense. It will not happen. The reason that have push globalization to its present stage will keep pushing globalization further in the future. And the main reason being technology. So that won't happen. And the time humanity adopts a sort of new uh, UN charter with uh, a sort of uh, serious moral compass that will align ethics so that populistic forces bump into a sort of ethics wall, that's, in my view, uh, far away. So, which is why I'm quite pessimistic. I see. Would you say this? I, I, I had to be pessimistic. Yeah, is that right? <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> thank I just you for making make sure. the case. <laughs> Um, would you say this rupture, this dissonance between the political forces and the economic forces, the divergence between the two, has that just crept up on us unexpected? Is it because people have, have uh, given up on, on growth and so they're just looking at how to share the, cut the pie amongst themselves? What happened? All right. There's, there's a bit of that short term. Uh, it's obvious that given what you have to redistribute in some systems uh, uh, for collective welfare. Uh, the lower the growth, the more the debate on how to share the little you create is tough. That's true. But that's not the fundamental problem. The, there is a sort of dialectic between the force, the speed of globalization, and the mobilization of identity. <coughs> uh, of no, there are strong elements of unity, again, economic integration, market capitalism, finance, technology, but there are also strong elements of social fragmentation. And one of the reasons for that is that, as we all know, globalization is incredibly efficient, but it is, so far, socially, also incredibly unjust. Polarizing. And we've, we've known that, including recently, where this whole debate on what do you do uh, with the concentration of wealth, what about the middle class in further globalization with the impact of technology on the sort of I middle see. range of job qualification? So these two phenomena, in a way, feed each other. Right. Thank you. Kirill, if I may come to you, um, I would have thought, given that you are certainly from a geopolitical sense in the, in the eye of the storm, or eye of a storm, uh, you would be very concerned about the world. Is that not the case? Well, actually, I'm moderately optimistic that the forces of wisdom and integration will prevail. But I do agree that the geopolitical uh, fight intensified uh, dramatically in the last couple of years. Uh, and frankly, I'd like to divide uh, you know, this geopolitical competition into two parts, the healthy one and the unhealthy one. And the healthy one, is, for example, is technology. So when somebody is competing for resources, for being efficient with other countries and advances technology, it's healthy competition because at the end of the day, uh, it makes the country stronger, but also fosters integration. And the unhealthy one is the one where you actually try to weaken other countries. And sometimes um, some people try to do it by actually setting a regional conflict that weakens the whole region. So we find this unhealthy competition unhealthy. And we find that. How would you characterize of, the current situation? So I believe it's currently very unhealthy. And okay. I think lots of new tools of economic warfare emerged. And we can talk about economic and media warfare, which is sort of a new reality of yes. using ideology, media, uh, combined sanctions to affect pressure. So, uh, but still, why do I believe that despite all of those tools of economic warfare, we'll be okay? First of all, uh, you know, every action gets counteraction. And when people try to use payment systems, rating agencies, um, you know, other methods, a sort of alternative emerge. 
And we see, for example, in many other countries, they develop their own payment systems, they develop their own rating agencies. And frankly, I think people are very much aware of this economic warfare tool chest that some people have, and they want to move away from those systems. A second point is we see a significant and rising cost of that kind of behavior. So um, I'm very surprised that people don't talk much about Iraq or Libya, but I think it's very clear that once you you know, do some actions, and as a result, there is a regional conflict. The, con uh, the cost of this are tremendous. So frankly, it's almost like a surgeon who keeps on operating, gets things wrong, but doesn't lo lose license and continues to do surgery. And we need to recognize those costs because, for example, some people are excited Russia is having economic crisis. Well, actually, one of the top hedge funds gave us this number, that if Russia has a major crisis, Europe will lose $300 billion. So let's talk about this cost, this real cost of sort of economic fighting, which is uh, quite significant. And I almost feel we need the World Anti-Monopoly Committee, because just in economy, when you have a monopoly, is bad for consumers. When you have some people try to assert geopolitical economy, is bad for the country, the cost is very significant. And the third reason I'm quite optimistic is that actually for growth, um, basically, Politicians, business people, employees, people, they need growth. And for growth, really integration and uh, communication is the only way. So that's why G20 is operational, that's why BRICS is happening, that's why lots of uh, unions are happening to promote that. We ourselves cooperate quite a bit with other sovereign wealth funds, and we created a big partnership with sovereign wealth funds, and we find it quite a good model. So to conclude, uh, we believe that geopolitical competition is impossible to stop. It's almost a Darwinian process that you know, will happen going forward. But we really need to promote healthy ways of geopolitical competition and really ask the right questions. And the right questions are when we are facing need to fight cancer, when we are facing need to do lots of great things, why are we so divided at this point in uh, society and in different countries? And for example, if you are so concerned about Ukraine, you know, should you be asking the right question, which is how do you pay 20, 30 billion dollars and who pays it to actually make Ukraine a stable economy? You know, very few people asking this question. Kill the bit I, I'm, I don't get is your moderately optimistic position here. <laughs> but you seem to be very pessimistic. No, no, no. <laughs> and I, I generally believe that we'll go through this, um, uh, this part of the cycle. I see. That frankly, the challenges for us are so significant that only by forward-looking approaches, by something that gets discussed here in Davos, by understanding the real cost of negativity will be positive and optimistic. That makes sense to me. It doesn't have to be destiny, I guess is what you're saying. People can get together and, and solve that. If I could just ask you specifically about sovereign wealth funds, would you say that sovereign wealth funds are a force for stability in a pool of funds, non-mark to market, they can potentially uh, be a source of patient capital, infrastructure investments and so on? or are they engines of, or perceived engines of economic statecraft, which in a low trust environment doesn't help? How would you? Yeah. Well, all of the key uh, sovereign wealth funds, they sign Santiago principles, which basically they abide to be pure economic agents. And that's very important because they have long-term capital, they can go through ups and downs of crises. So we believe that sovereign wealth funds are incredibly positive force. Uh, and uh, Arab sovereign wealth funds is a good example. When oil price was high, you know, trillions of dollars went into those funds that now provide good stability for the region. So we frankly believe that sovereign wealth funds is a good force for good and cooperation between sovereign wealth funds is important for future growth. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lee, why should we be worried? Well, coming from China, I follow the tradition of Confucius. That is to always respect and follow the uh, senior and uh, and the wise guys. Here we have <laughs> Mr. Lamy. <laughs> well, I'm joking. Uh, despite his being here, I still argue that uh, geopolitical competition uh, derails um, economic integration. Uh, why? Because economic e integration requires concrete things, requires business to business right, investment, and the business to business deals, requires to people to people deals, like tourism like uh, um, uh, consumption, like importing goods, right? consuming other countries' products. 
and also requires government to government agreements to lower the barrier of trade, right? <coughs> and uh, Mr. Lamy's whole career, as least part of it, is devoted to, to this, right? Government to government deals. And today, in our world of, geo of intensified geopolitical geo uh, competition, we see in all three areas, things are slowing down, right? Take the example of uh, the Japan, the China-Japan dispute in South China Sea. By the way, the Japanese side, even today, the government refuses to recognize there's a dispute. This sounds very strange, right? There's a dispute, and they say there's no dispute. We are the owner of the islands. Whatever, right? It sounds very ridiculous. That's, that's why I follow, I fully respect Ms. Lamy. Politics is irrational, it's passionate. Anyway, so what's the consequence of the we, South China? We have China? some Japanese members in the audience. Yeah, we can we'll be able see. to bring them in. <laughs> we can. Um, we'll hear yeah. your views, right? Well, well, I was only stating a fact. I'm not making any <laughs> points, right? Yes. <laughs> we'll come okay. back to you, sir. <laughs> we can come back. We can come back. Yes. <laughs> okay. We can come back. Yeah. At least the government of Japan's statement. I can quote them, right? Anyway, what's the consequence? The consequence is that Japanese goods should be doing well in China. Take the example of Japanese cars. Japanese cars are actually wonderful products for the habits of Chinese consumers, right? But unfortunately, this past, for the past two years, Japanese cars are not doing nearly as well as uh, imported cars from Germany and other parts of the world, right? Because people to people uh, exchange, the feelings are not uh, normal, right? And uh, take the example of uh, the Russian the Russian-Ukraine dispute. When I say dispute, do you agree with this dispute? Maybe there's no dispute. Anyway, <laughs> doesn't matter. It's an internal Ukrainian matter. Okay, internal <laughs> Ukraine matter, right? <laughs> it's a matter. It's a matter. <laughs> I, I, I just love the fact that you're looking to have a dispute with everybody around. Here, That's right. right. Well, <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm just trying to recognize the facts. So the Russian, with as consequence of the dispute, the Russian economy is not doing well, right? The projection is that it will contract 5%, another 5% this year, on top of last year's contraction. And then now, Russia is speeding up its negotiation with China in building oil pipes and gas pipes. Well, this, is, this may be wonderful for the, for the Chinese interest. However, from a global interest point of view, this may not be. Why? Because Russia, part of Russia is close to Europe. That you, Russia should have done uh, projects with Europe, uh, with Eastern Europe, with other parts of uh, uh, the, the world. Rather, China, Russia is looking to China to look for deals. So this is locally, locally beneficial. However, globally, it's not beneficial. So overall, I would argue that geopolitical con competition is not good for global integration and growth. Thank you for that, Professor Lee. Annabelle, if I may come to you now. We just had a very active demonstration of why we should be worried. Uh, I don't know if this was staged or not, but uh, it, you, you, <laughs> you proved the point very well. Right. Uh, why are you optimistic? Well, I think that uh, you know, geoeconomic competition uh, as a factor uh, derailing economic integration and growth is, uh, is highly overrated. Um, I think that in the first place, uh, trade, integration, economic growth are not controlled by the state, uh, except at the margins, and we may, may come to this. Um, second, other fa factors are more important. Um, the private sector, uh, multinational enterprises in particular, uh, drive uh, global trade and investment flows. Um, statistics, for instance, are from UNCTAD say that 80% of the world today, of uh, uh, world trade today, is organized uh, around international production networks. Uh, so I think that this is a very strong force uh, in favor of, uh, uh, of uh, growth uh, economic integration. Second, and it has been mentioned here uh, before, uh, technology is also a key driver of a trade of integration of uh, growth. Uh, technology, for example, enabled uh, global value chains by lowering transportation costs and enhancing uh, uh, communications. 
Uh, it can also have an impact on trade, for instance, uh, and we will see that in the years to come uh, with uh, 3D ro uh, uh, printing, for example, or robotics uh, and others. And um, institutions are also uh, an important factor uh, underpinning uh, uh, trade uh, and, uh, and economic growth. And uh, in particular, I think that the WTO and its agreements have played a very important role and play a very important role uh, in, uh, in providing a framework that will uh, permit trade uh, and investment to, to flow and uh, economic growth uh, to happen. Just recently, for example, the WTO ruled uh, that uh, some uh, restrictions that China had placed on rare earths, for example, that was a very uh, controversial matter, uh, were contrary to the WTO. And uh, China has expressed that it will uh, uh, eliminate uh, those restrictions. So, uh, you know, uh, private sector technology uh, institutions are very important factors uh, influencing uh, global growth. Now, geoeconomic competition cannot either deliver uh, meaningful agreements. Uh, geoeconomic competition may play a role in deciding to start the negotiation of an agreement, uh, but it is not enough uh, to uh, conclude the agreement. Uh, normally, there are very strong domestic uh, forces within a country uh, that uh, oppose meaningful agreements. So for them to be able to be realized, you need to have strong uh, economic and commercial uh, underpinnings. And uh, finally, I would like to say that the evidence on where geopolitical competition is taking us uh, as regards integration is not totally clear or is mixed, uh, if you wish. Um, if you look at uh, negotiations of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the uh, uh, trans pacific Trade uh, and Investment Partnership or uh, the Regional Cooperation uh, Economic Partnership uh, in different parts of the world, uh, you may think that they're going in one direction. But on the other hand, you also have that uh, China and the U.S. are negotiating a bilateral investment agreement, uh, the EU and China as well. Uh, maybe soon we will have uh, uh, negotiations between India and the U.S. again uh, on investment. Uh, then there are plurilateral negotiations in the U.S. Uh, where, for instance, China is participating or interested in participating as well. So to me, the signals are, are rather mixed. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't go uh, all the way to say that uh, geopolitical competition uh, is actually derailing uh, economic integration. Thank you for that. I, I can uh, relate to the argument you make that there are other factors that may be further up the hierarchy. Uh, I read a report here in Davos just a couple of days ago uh, that suggests that underinvestment in global infrastructure, infrastructure globally, is probably the number one uh, headwind against global growth. Um, if I may come to you, sir, one more time. Uh, particularly if you could cast your mind back to the WTO days, and both of you have worked there uh, before, uh, you of course as Director General, it, were those the good old days? And is this the new context where everyone's fighting, or do we have a, a roast-tinted view of how good it used to be and how bad it is right now? Well, in, in order to answer this question, I'm afraid I have to change camp. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the power's argument. Maybe you should change <laughs> sit, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid I'll have to change camp because, uh, A, I very much agree with what Annabelle said, which is that what the factors, the shaping factors of economic globalization and integration are there they are stable, they will keep integrating. That institutions, some institutions, may play a role in this. And I would very much agree that, uh, uh, I mean, among other international organizations, the WTO has a sort of specific efficiency coefficient. It works better on the purpose it has, which is reducing obstacles to trade than other organizations who have other purposes but in the same global level. And I totally disagree with this notion that, you know, because there are bilateral deeds going here and there, uh, the multilateral system is in chambers. Uh, that doesn't, I mean, it doesn't work. What matters at the end of the day in this trade field is whether trade obstacles are growing or shrinking. 
and the reality is that trade obstacles are shrinking. There are skirmishes here and there. Now, where I would retake my camp answering <laughs> uh, to Annabelle, I mean, what Annabelle says, it looks look, look fine. It, it works without governments. It's business, it's finance, it's technology. Don't bother these governments who are in the realm of passion. Well, governments matter, Annabelle. And governments have to be sustained by a sort of legitimization process. They need a stock of legitimacy to remain in place, whether in democratic systems or in other systems where legitimization is uh, taking a different shape. And in order to keep this legitimization base, in many cases, they need to mobilize passion. And we are in a world where there is a lot of passion available. Notably, and I'm not saying this because I'm French, uh, on religious grounds. The world of today is a world where religious antagonisms are stronger than they were 50 years ago. Well, that's not a good sign. Well, I'm very glad you came back to your line of argument, sir. And I think for Professor Lee, it's going to pose a problem because the Confucian's values, <laughs> if you're going to follow him, I don't know how that's going to work out. But uh, if I could, um, you mentioned China and the rare earth instance, uh, incident. Um, a more recent one is what you might characterize as economic nationalism under the guise of cyber security. So I want my own ATM machines. I want my own Windows operating system because I may not trust the, uh, uh, the foreign ones. Do you think that is taking hold, this pullback protectionism under the guise of cyber security? Oh, well, first of all, we're in Davos, so we have to follow the <laughs> internationally accept the principle. So I'm not always blindly following the senior and wise people, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've sent up to my own, own judgments, right? Okay, come back to your, to your point, whether they are, uh, whether they are um, uh, economic nationalism under the uh, uh, cybersecurity stuff. Um, I think there's some truth to it. There's some truth to it because um, uh, because behind all these policies, they are real economic interests, right? They are real investments done by local people who would try to get better benefit by excluding imports from other countries. But that being said, I, let me still strongly argue that there are real cases, there are real cases in which um, the cyber technology, the internet technology is used by some countries or some groups of people to exploit other groups of people. So there are lots of evidence of that. And again, it's dispute. No one knows <laughs> the, 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 what what's really happens, but we know for sure lots of this is a very, very uh, dirty uh, parts of the world, right? So in this regard, I do argue that because of geopolitical competition, Right, internet unfortunately is utilized as a weapon to attack uh, other other groups, other camps. So therefore, this slows down the necessary integration of the economy. And well, you wanted to come in. I'll come to you. Yes, I uh, I want to take a, a couple of the points that uh, Pascal was made to, uh, making to say that I I certainly recognize the role of governments. I was a minister uh, myself, so I can uh, uh, I, I need to support uh, the idea that governments are relevant. Huh? Um, <laughs> now, uh, on uh, uh, I think that the question is I think you're right in saying that governments need to have uh, uh, legitimacy and that sometimes they um, uh, they use populist uh, measures. Uh, to find that legitimacy. But I would also argue that governments cannot go against economic rationale for too long a time. There are a few exceptions, certainly in the world, but they are very few. Uh, because governments that do that will not remain in power for, for long. I say I recognize there are a couple of exceptions out there. Uh, I but ask for names? Uh, no, no, not necessarily. Uh, but <laughs> uh, and the third point is that we have been discussing here, I think, different things because we've been discussing geoeconomic competition, geopolitical competition, and then other factors, for instance, such as religion. And I do think 
that all these factors may come to play and that at, at some point, uh, you know, they may come together into a, 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 a melange that is not, uh, is not very good uh, for, uh, for the world. But uh, what I would argue is that these other forces that I mentioned are, are a much more stabilizing factor, uh, again, in most cases. Uh, 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 and that history has shown that to be the case as well. Kirill, if you just look at it from a business point of view, there is very low visibility on how state actors may or may not act in a coordinated manner. Um, regulatory authorities are not working in a coordinated manner. How can it not derail growth? Well, I think the force to um, address key issues for the world is a very important one. And what we see is, for example, technology example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned the computers that, you know, nationalism will sort of take. Uh, I think what happens is for societies, they want to use economic punishment tools. They will suffer. Because if you can buy a computer from that nation, and you know if you misbehave in their opinion, it explodes, then you'll buy it from a nation that doesn't use tool of economic uh, influence and aggression. So I think we are a big believer that for the world growth to happen, um, you know, something that uh, Pascal mentioned uh, before is, is really critical, which is WTO kind of cooperation on trade, similar kind of cooperation on investment. And that is uh, uh, the force that will be more powerful than isolationist uh, economic ways to uh, affect situations that over the long term will not really work. And the final point is I believe actually terrorism is a byproduct of unhealthy geopolitical competition. Because maybe if you look at the roots of terrorism and why it exploded so recently in the recent terms, then you start thinking about why it happened and what role geopolitical competition plays there. Um, Animal, if I think about um, uh, the Gordon Brown G8 meeting 2009 that was supposed to be the one that led to a coordinated response mm -hmm. to the global financial crisis. Well, firstly, we don't have a G8 anymore. Um, but uh, emblematically, that sort of cohesion, is it gone for good? Well, I think that we are in the process of a transformation, if you wish, of, uh, of uh, the uh, international economic uh, and political order. And we, you know, we see uh, uh, signals of that every day. If you come to think about the uh, participation of uh, developing countries, for instance, in uh, global trade and investment flows, it's quite significant. Uh, today, the amount, uh, you know, the uh, trade coming from de uh, developing countries uh, um, uh, trade is about 50% of global trade. Uh, investment flows, about a quarter of investment flows originate in developing countries. So uh, we are indeed seeing a very important uh, transformation. Uh, and I think that uh, we, you know, it, to me it's a question of more, what is the dynamic that we are going to follow to reach a, like a, a, a stability in this new order? Is it going to be sort of negotiated top down as it was uh, uh, in the, in, uh, in the, the previously? Uh, or is it going to come through different combinations of agreements uh, and, uh, you know, integration mechanisms that eventually uh, may, uh, may come together? So I think that this is the, the, the question that we have before us. But there is no, uh, no question to me uh, that we are indeed moving uh, towards, a, uh, towards a new uh, uh, normal, if you wish. Okay. Uh, I'm, if I may on this one, sure. I think the example of the G8 versus the G20 is an interesting one. The G8 started with the G5, which were pure economics. During that period, of, let's say, it started in 1974, 35 years, it moved slowly into geopolitics. A large part of the G8 discussions, and I was a GH Sherpa for a long time, were geopolitical issues. So, in a way, it was a time where this integration was still there. Now, take the G20. The G20 can only discuss economics. It's no coincidence that even things which are in between geoeconomics and geopolitics, like environment, for instance, have been totally evacuated from the G20 table because the disagreements were too large. So that's a strong argument to show that this integration of the past is now in bad shape. I'm, I'm looking for arguments. Uh, <laughs> that's, arguments. That's a very I think that's one. That's a good one. Let me. Uh, 
turn to the audience now, if I may, uh, to see if we have questions from people in the room. Who would like to start with the first question? None at all? OK, if you want to take a few more minutes to think, and I will ask uh, <laughs> my next question to uh, Professor Lee. Mm. When China and the, the BRICS, they set up their own bank, uh, the investment bank, the infrastructure bank, is this a new world order in the sense that um, um, it's a competing ideology versus what we have right now? Or do they just want their own version of the IMF and their own version of ADB? And so there's really no clash of ideology in a geopolitical sense, but it's just, uh, you know, I want my own. How do you uh, neither, that? neither. I think all the um, infrastructure, institutional infrastructure being proposed last year uh, within the BRIC countries actually are efforts to gradually and uh, constructively push uh, evolution, the evolution of the existing uh, global economic uh, uh, governance. So f take the example of the, um, the BRIC, the, uh, the, the, the BRIC okay. uh, investment bank, right? The BRIC investment bank actually operates uh, to, uh, to cooperate <coughs> with existing institutions like the Asian Development Bank and the, the World Bank. And uh, the working language most likely will be English and the voting rights uh, mostly will be equally shared uh, among the member countries. And so the BRIC investment bank is not meant to compete with the World Bank, rather to augment the size and the impact of the World Bank. I see. If I could now uh, just, uh, if, if we have a microphone, please. Uh, give it to Mr. Hasegawa from uh, Takeda, Japan. Please. Yeah, audience is expecting me to raise uh, the territorial iron dispute issue, but I'm not going to raise that. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, but uh, since uh, uh, government leaders and the uh, world uh, organization leaders are here, I'd like to ask about the free trade agreement. Uh, we are now focusing on concluding the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, amongst the 12 nations but the United States and Japan are leading this discussion. And hopefully within a few ma uh, matter of a few months, in this year we will be able to reach a, a conclusion, um, at least uh, bilaterally between the United States and Japan. Uh, both countries are producing uh, more than 80% of the 12 nations uh, con congregated uh, total. So we are the leading position, but at the same time, we are in parallel, uh, from Japan's viewpoint, pursuing uh, free trade agreement with EU and also RCEP, Regional uh, Comprehensive uh, Econo Economic Partnership in uh, major Southeast Asian countries, and also bilateral with Australia was just concluded. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, his uh, former leadership organization, WTO, just didn't work to you know, uh, put this uh, together. Uh -oh. There are so many uh, different reasons uh, existed. But how, wh what do you guys think about the, uh, this type of the uh, regional or geopolitical uh, you know, group uh, free trade uh, uh, discussions and agreement? Thank you, Hesegao san if, I, if you want to just hold on to uh, that question, I'd like to uh, pass the, uh, the microphone to Sir John Soros, please. Uh, thanks very much, and <clears throat> I was one of those who voted no to the question uh, because I thought it was, uh, whilst there's no doubt that geoeconomic competition does do some damage to international growth, the chance of it derailing economic growth on its own, I think, are limited. Um, and that's the, the current disputes or disputes that Mr. Dimitrov was talking about. Um, they, they do cause damage to the European economy, but it's not going to derail. There are other things, other bigger derailers than that. But the one I'm most concerned about is the US-China relationship, where there isn't a threat at the moment of geoeconomic competition, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just interested in Professor Lee's thoughts in particular about how the economic dimension of uh, the US-China relationship can be taken forward uh, to entrench what will be the most important 
single political relationship in the 21st century. Um, so avoid it becoming the sort of geoeconomic rivalry that could both destabilize uh, uh, the uh, uh, large parts of the world or, and, and, and at the same time um, uh, have a really serious impact on economic growth. Mm. Presently. Wonderful question. Uh, this actually uh, give me a chance to illustrate uh, the, my proposition. Um, U.S.-China relationship, uh, relationship. I think on both sides, uh, with, uh, especially with the new leaders uh, coming in on the Chinese side, um, uh, governments recognize that this political relationship is extremely important. It's most important for China and perhaps for the U.S. So leaders on both sides, also elites on both sides, recognize that this relationship is more important than pure economic and trade. So on the Chinese side, there's, there's wide recognition that China should do number one job, number one thing in its, in its diplomacy is to maintain a working and good relationship with the US. Even though China and, the, China and Japan are not enjoying the best relationship, but China works very hard to maintain the relationship with the US. And, uh, so to put it in a simple language, uh, China says, well, the US is still the boss, number one. China is not going to challenge the US mm -hmm. supremacy, not in the near future, perhaps, perhaps never. Mm. Uh, starting from this, all economic deals can be relatively easily resolved. So it's not the other around. It's not the economics working for the political relation. It's the political relation changing or anchoring the economic relationship. Mr. Lummi, so would you like to respond to Mr. Hassan? I'll, I'll, of course, I'll respond. Both. But on this one, I'm, I'm certain that that's what you wish to happen. I'm not certain that this is what will happen. For one reason, which is a simple one, which is back to this economics versus politics. If I'm the US president, I will need a lot of energy to convince Congress to sign something that has to do with trade with China. Why? Because lobbies will be affected by this, will use an anti-Chinese narrative in the US public opinion, which is available. Now, same on the Chinese side. There's, there's, let, let's assume these discussions take place within the Politburo. If I want to oppose a measure that the majority of the Politburo thinks is good for China, I would say, you're caving in to the US. And this has a lot of resonance in Chinese public opinion. So again, that's what you wish. And then there are the political realities. And it sometimes may be different, which, which in a way, which is why we need clever politicians. Huh? Otherwise, that wouldn't be of much use. Now, on, on, the, on opening trade, on this, I'm extremely pragmatic. I'm, I'm with the Chinese proverb, don't mind the color of the cat, provided uh, it catches mice. Now, whether the cat is multilateral, regional, bilateral, plurilateral, what matters is whether trade is more open or not. Now, trade is more open than it was five years ago. Five years ago, it was more open than it was 10 years ago, which is, by the way, where you have to judge the record of the WTO, not by the scenery of you know, negotiations, which are a big theater where, uh, again, domestic constituency issues play a big role. What matters is that all these processes taken together synergize in eliminating progressively obstacles to trade which change with time. This is what will happen with TPP, which won't be a great thing, but it will be done. Now, the arbitration between substance and speed, which is a, always a big problem in trade negotiations, has reached the state of majority with TPP. I think the partners in the Trans-Pacific negotiation now all agree that they spent enough time and that just get what's in there. It's not much, by the way, but let's get it done. And this is how things move. Thank you. We just have a few minutes left. If I could uh, ask Kirill for your comments and then Annabel and then 
Uh, I think a very first. fascinating question and I think very interesting discussion here. I think whenever we have a world and what you know just was discussed, the US is so possessive of its number one role in the world that it expects other countries to sort of treat it as a boss and whenever somebody gets strong enough it may retaliate the facts through partnerships. And do we want a world where that is an ever going reality going forward? I think my reality is that China will get stronger and it would not want to do what you mentioned, you know, to treat U.S. as a boss who, you know, needs to be dealt with as a boss. And I think we generally need to move to a world where leading nations do not try to be so possessive of number one place, but recognize that only by, uh, you know, being more humble uh, will the world be a better place. If we go back to uh, our question, will the economic competition derail economic uh, growth and integration? I, I, I continue to say that uh, no, it may be a factor that, uh, that may impact uh, uh, it, but other factors, again, uh, will uh, tend to stabilize this. Uh, so we, uh, I think that we are in a good uh, position. Firstly, 30 seconds. Very quick, two top priorities of Chinese leaders, who, whoever they are, right now are 20 years. Number one, make sure making peaceful relationship with the rest of the world. Main thing, the US. Second, make sure the economy continues to grow. And currently, and from now on, the economy is no longer as dependent on trade as it used to be. Trade as a share of GDP is coming down. That's why I maintain my point that maintaining good relationship with the USA, regardless of trade, is most important. Okay, we've come to the uh, end of our time for the debate. It's time to look at the results. To, to see if um, the collective opinion of people in the room has changed or not. So you know the motion, geoeconomic competition derails economic growth and integration. Agree or disagree? Please vote one more time. You're not voting, sir. You can tell me your... Uh... No? Disagree, okay. Okay, Donald, should we see the result, please? Uh -huh. <laughs> we did. Two percent of the points. <laughs> the needle did move. And, With more uh, time, it would have been better. And, and, <laughs> and, and if Mr. Hasegawa had used the voting pad, <laughs> would have gone even a little bit more towards uh, an even split. So it uh, looks like we're. <laughs> and also, people kept on shifting their positions, which to me suggests that there's still hope, that uh, there is hope for convergence. It doesn't have to be uh, polarized. I just want to thank the panel, uh, particularly because um, uh, you were very sportive and took polarized positions on a topic that is highly nuanced, and obviously reality is always somewhere in the middle. So thank you very much, and thank you, obviously, to the audience as well.